So during this thing, I got to, I was asked to work with a NBA team and prioritize some things with them and develop some stuff. So working with them, this is kind of, if I'm going to prioritize the things, there needs to be a visual peripheral vision aspect to your training because I think basketball is probably one of the most visual reaction slash peripheral sports that we play that you have to have a true sense of the whole the whole field and we actually look at some athletes that didn't have that and how we can improve that um, and of course I'm going to throw in their top end speed needs to raise the ceiling what the body can do and the faster you can run you're going to jump higher because again we're raising the ceiling of what the body can do and basketball players spend a lot of time at 70 80 percent with a hard first two steps so if we can raise that ceiling those first two steps are going to be even better can you get to top end speed from different positions like is someone grabbing onto you or are you grabbing onto someone is my head looking back for a ball while i'm at top end speed which is most of the time in basketball that i'm looking for something while trying to sprint as fast as i can uh, are my shoulders square over my hips while i'm sprinting so you can hit all these different positions and get your body used to being in those positions so you feel safe so you can sprint faster by looking back uh, which again was something that we talked about earlier um, and can i excel from different positions where are my feet when i excel are they crooked are they sideways am i taking one lateral step and then turning and running those are all things that you can look at and i'm going to show you some examples in a second lateral movement I think in high school basketball, way too many people do all these shuffle drills and they never give their shin any direction of where to go. They just keep their shins completely vertical as they shuffle along, which is you're giving no horizontal push to move horizontally. Um, and again, I can later on, I can do more times with this. And most importantly, you need to do all this with the ball as well. Uh, this team identified that your best basketball, your fastest basketball players dribble the bar, ball harder and with more frequency than anyone else. And that's, they looked at the whole NBA. Uh, and I forgot who the, I should know these things, who the best guard was, but his frequency and power in dribbling the ball had a huge impact on his play. Uh, so that's something that you may want to look at. Uh, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, so here are some ideas uh, for jumping. You can adjust the rims for slam dunk contest. You can put a small two, three, four inch box in front to jump off of. It just changes the stiffness throughout the system. Uh, we do agility runs with obstacles in the way. So you can put hula hoops out. Or basically what we would do is we would run what's marked on the court. So whether it's the tip off point, that circle, you can work those circles. You can work the base, not the baseline, but the three point arc. You can work the free throw key thing, whatever that thing is called. Uh, and then we put things in the way. So as you're moving in different directions, you have to identify and detect things that are in the way like a pick or something like that and learn to move through while you're trying to keep your good body angles and things like that. Uh, agility runs should all have some kind of visual cue like you're running one way someone shifts you have to change directions uh, and then when you're doing that of course, you can do the Daniel Kahneman three column math. So all of these different adjustments take place in the fast brain. So you can run plays and do slow plays by doing the math problems. So that was kind of that whole training thing. Uh, and then when you get good at that stuff, we're going to add water bags. Uh, we, I have the ones that strap on for basketball players. So now you're learning to deal uh, with muscle co-contractions in your spine while you're moving. And you can do wear them for shooting as well um, because now you're going to be constantly off balance and you've got to follow through and get to that finish point no matter where you're at. And why was Jordan great as we'll watch tonight on ESPN is no matter where he was falling to, he could finish. Uh, I think tonight the episode is uh, the Jordan rules where you don't let him get off the ground, but yet he was still scoring. Uh, I already mentioned uh, court for agility and technique for movement again when you're laterally moving or these different ways you have to you've got to drop those shins down when you push whether it's laterally diagonally or forward uh, and get your center of mass out in front Whew. was that fast enough you did great 
later on, if you got questions, I can go over more stuff later. Uh, however you guys want to do it. Tyler, we probably have a lot of questions. Dustin asked, uh, per reaction peripheral is huge for volleyball as well. Yeah, pretty much. Not as much as basketball because you get to see everything straight on. You don't have people coming at you from the side. But, uh, yes, there's a huge reaction component to volleyball. And when we're talking about basketball, Chris, or best volleyball, you have two kids that played volleyball, or one still does. And uh, uh, I, I've read once where Bush Exnader believed that 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 sprint training was actually good for volleyball players, even though they never take more than a step or two in either direction. So not. I hope my son's not listening. Um, <laughs> So in boys volleyball, they aren't the most athletic group that come into play. So they have no, they don't even know where their ceiling is, their neural ceiling is. So to get them to sprint and learn how to sprint and find a neural ceiling, it's just going to make everything else that much easier. So you agree that, that, that you are doing something that is not specific to the sport at all, but it still is a defining athletic improvement. Yes. Wow. I want to, I want the, if I, I don't, shit, I've seen so many volleyball games. I don't know how many kids are on the floor. Um, I think six, I think there's six. Um, if I can have six really good athletes out on the floor, I'm going to beat six good volleyball players. Right. That's cool. Same thing with soccer. If I have, however many people play soccer, if I have, I think there's 11, right? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> 11 so i, I got no 11 idea. really good athletes out there that have some soccer skills against 11 good soccer players that aren't very good athletes who's going to win that game which leads us to something i was telling you about this this morning in you know here i am <laughs> i don't know how many people play on a soccer team all right but yet here i am talking to two division one soccer people uh at umass and in a podcast and it, our overarching ideas can still help these guys out. And the interesting thing they were telling me was that they, with catapult system, and everything that, that their kids, basically the, the ones who were playing all the time ran about nine miles of half ass running, you know, like sub 50% of their max speed. And then about 500 yards of sprinting in a game. And so if you, you would think maybe you should, train 99 percent at half speed but it's really the opposite you want to train for the things that make soccer players great and it's that 500 yards of sprinting that usually scores and so um that that's one of the hardest things i think for coaches to think about and i think it has a lot to do with what we're talking about with distance running that yes you know a lot of running is probably a good thing but but it should not be 97 percent of your training I think the way, uh, Tony, that you actually this morning addressed that thought was you asked the UMass guys something about explosive plays. I don't know exactly how you said it, but I thought that was a really good way of saying it. And for the soccer player, the explosive play is, is within that 500 yards of sprinting that they do within a game. And so to be able to train that for a lot of times when you see a 1-0 score at the end of the game, that, that's the key uh, that you need to be focused on for there. But anyway, you structured it really well this morning. It really, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting stuff because, uh, because it is counterintuitive to, uh, that, that you do not want to train to be a nine mile runner. You want to train to be a scorer. And one of the things I asked them, which I think uh, said a lot, I said, who, you know, like, hell, I, I haven't watched more than two minutes of soccer in my life. So who is it on your UMass soccer team that, dominates is it the person who's really good at running nine miles or is it the fast one they go they laughed they go the fast one i said well that tells you where your focus should be chris what is what is some of the shin angle indicators just or just or about to answer that say what are the things you look for on those <laughs> lateral change of directions with shins is that still a focus or all right so this is lame because i have a video but the video is really jumpy so here's my shins okay i know it's upside down and all that so when I go to drive, or here's what bad, here's what I think, bro, go away. Everyone <laughs> left and nobody's letting the dogs out and they're all over me. Go, 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 go. So here's how people do their 
lateral shuffles, okay? And you can go, I, I saw, and it, this came to me because I saw it on someone's Facebook, like here we're doing our lateral movement stuff and their shins are like this way. But if I'm going that way, this is not very efficient. I mean, it's like walking on stilts. So when I go to drive, I have to dry, drop to here. So when I press, I'm actually going this way. So watch tonight, watch on ESPN when Jordan makes a move, watch him drop that back shin and his force is all going almost completely horizontal and that other leg follows and he's going that way. Uh, time and time again, you see Jordan do that. Um, with the team that I was working with, we broke down some film from some of their their point guards and other point guards. It's cool when you work with professional sports teams, you ask for video and it's there in an hour. Um, <laughs> And you can see it happen that they can all drop that shin. And in high school, we're all doing this, which is why you don't have a lot of really good people that move laterally in basketball. Yeah, so Megan, so it's really working ankle and forefoot rocker with your shins not over the, your foot. So you can ankle rock in any direction. And you can forefoot rock in any direction. That's really what makes great athletes. And Jordan can go, and I know I keep picking on Jordan, but I mean, come on, I'm Chicago. There's nothing else in Chicago going on now other than this ESPN thing. Watch him, he can go in any direction. He can drop shins in any direction and be there in a heartbeat.